Uh, there. Okay, I have started recording the meeting a mere 13 minutes after beginning. Sorry about that. Um, in the previous, for those of you who are just starting with this video, in the previous um, uh, 13 minutes, I revealed all the fundamental secrets of interactive storytelling. Now I'm just filling in some details. Um, Anyway, please put in your, there we go, put in your estimate of how evil Darth Vader is. And we're getting some numbers coming in. So we got minus 0 0.9, minus 0 0.8, minus 0 0.85, minus 0 0.7, minus 0 0.8. Okay. Um, let's see. Now let me ask who's right? Which is these numbers is the correct number. Yep, it's subjective. <laughs> it, none of these numbers are correct. They are personal judgments, which is really what art is all about. Uh, I need to back up for a second and explain one other thing. On bounded numbers, I do the, the range the range on bounded numbers is relative to the population. That is, we, uh, we don't have units like meters, grams, seconds, uh, light years, or anything like that. You can't say Darth Vader is uh, 22 nasties uh, of evil or minus 57 uh, roses of good, something like that. There are no units. And so the only way of measuring something is relative to what? I would say everybody else. And so you need a, a measure, a, a relative measure. And uh, the best way to do this really would be to base it on the overall population on a uh, uh, percentile basis. Something like saying, uh, well, Darth Vader is in the, uh, on, the, on the curve of, of good and evil where 99% is a saint and 1% is a really bad villain. Then Darth Vader is around 1%. So you could do it that way. Um, however, for a lot of purposes, it's much, much better to stretch that thing out so that zero represents average and minus one is extreme bad and plus one is extreme good. However, even that runs into a problem. Uh, that's the system I use with bounded numbers. And it is certainly simple and easy to understand. However, it does run into a problem that there are always real extremes, people way out at the fringes there who really should be beyond the range of one or minus one. And the way you would do that is with a standard statistical distribution. You could use the binomial distribution or the normal distribution. And that, that does permit you to go beyond one uh, out, you know, much further. However, those distributions involve, I mean, there are some standard formulas for, for how they work. Uh, those formulas though are definitely on the messy side. Um, I, I can work with them, but I suspect most people would be completely uh, wiped out by them. Uh, for example, the binomial distribution, the, the function for it is n choose k times p to the k times one minus p net to the n minus k. Uh, I can write that up pretty quickly, but uh, most people would be unwilling to use that. That's just too hairy. And the binomial distribution is just a hairy, hairy mess. So someday we really should use the binomial. The, the, I'm sorry, I'm sorry the, uh, 
No, I've got it backwards. The normal distribution is the hairy mess. The binomial is the simple one. Um, someday I or somebody should write up a simple package uh, that somehow makes it much easier to use the, uh, the binomial uh, function. And then we could, we could have a, a, a more precise system. However, the bounded number system is really simple, and especially with the blend operator, it's a very handy tool. So for now, I think it's best that we live with bounded numbers. Okay, we were talking about how evil Darth Vader is and the fundamental concept that this is a subjective notion. I'd like to expand upon that by talking about uh, the, the, the fundamental difference between mathematics and what we're doing, which is analogous to engineering. Uh, for example, the value of pi mathematically is 3.14159265358979323 and more digits. Um, however, when was the last time you used that value in any calculation? I mean, seriously, if you have, I mean, for most purposes, I mean, here we go. You make a cake, and a round cake, and you're going to put some icing on top, and you need to figure out how much icing do I need. Are you really going to calculate pi r squared? Of course not. You'll just use three for pi and then yeah maybe r squared very is an approximation but that's the thing for most purposes what we do in the real world is not mathematical mathematics is an idealized system that requires proof and you have to have the correct formula and that holds back a lot of people because i don't know what the correct formula for this problem is and so they think it can't be done and the answer is no, you make an approximation. The same way you do with a million other things, you just sort of get in the general ballpark. For some purposes, you need to be more exact. For other purposes, you need to be less exact. Uh, I was making some spacers yesterday for some uh, wheels for a tank I'm building and I needed, to, needed the spacers to be about half an a quarter inch. Uh, uh, wide, but uh, I didn't actually measure them all and mark them all. I just kind of with the saw lined it up. Yeah, that's about a quarter inch. Yeah, that's about a quarter inch. And just did it that way. Um, and it worked. So uh, uh, we do lots of approximations and uh, I'm urging you don't worry about using approximations. Uh, you have to. That's necessary. Don't be afraid of a problem merely because you don't have the exact answer. If you can get into the general area, that's good enough. Um, so you're going to be uh, 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 approximating stuff. This applies to functions as well as to numbers. For example, let's talk about uh, a very simple function. Um, what's the probability that uh, that Darth Vader will, you know, use his magic force to strangle somebody uh, solely as a function of how evil he is, one-dimensional? So probability, we're, we're talking probability of strangling as a function of how evil he is. And so if he's really evil, he has a high probability. And if he's not very evil, he has a low probability. We need to write an equation for that. Now, the very first thing you learn, at least in physics, is when in doubt, draw a picture. Uh, you, you always start off by Try and make a visual representation of the problem. In this case, the picture you want to uh, create is a graph. So you draw a little, little, you sketch a graph. What kind of graph is this going to be? 
there are three basic types of graph that you're going to use in almost all of your work. And those are one, a straight line, two, a line that curves down, or three, a line that curves up. That's it. In other words, if you're thinking in calculus terms, first derivative equals zero, first derivative is positive, first derivative is negative. But you don't have to think of it that way if you don't like calculus. You can just say straight line, curving up or curving down. So first you decide, well, which of these functions, which of these linear shapes best fits it? Uh, a more evil person is very likely to strangle, but uh, is it linear? Does it curve up? Does it curve down? Let's hear some, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, you're right, Chris. It's second derivative is uh, zero positive or negative. Um, right now, I'd like everybody to uh, type into the chat thing, your estimate of which better fits reality for uh, how the probability of strangling some, of killing somebody based on how evil they are. Is it straight line, curve up or curve down? God damn, you guys are smart. Yep, that, that's my answer to my reasoning. And I'd like to hear yours. My reasoning is that a person who's only mildly evil is really unlikely to kill somebody. You got to be really seriously evil to kill somebody. So that means it's going to be flat at first, low and flat, but then it's got to shoot up as you get to more uh, evil. That's my thinking. Did anybody have a, a different way of reasoning this out? Apparently not. Okay. Okay. So... Uh, Notice that just thinking about this is your assessment of human nature. This is an artistic judgment on your part. This is not engineering. This is art expressed in mathematical terms. But this is a very important concept here. You can express art through a million different ways. For example, you can take a cow and kill it, cut open its belly and pull out its intestines, squeeze all the shit out of the intestines, wash them, clean them, dry them out. And then you can extract parts, you can cut them up into long pieces. And then you can mount those, stretch them and mount them on a, on a long stick thing. And when you've got them stretched and you can have heavier ones and thinner ones and so forth. And then when you rub a bow across it, you've got a violin because the strings in violins through most of history were made with something called cat gut, which is cattle guts. Literally, I'm not, I'm not making any of this up. Uh, you know, you can make art using cattle guts. Uh, people use rocks to make sculpture. I mean, they, you can do art a million different ways and math is just one of them. And in fact, math is particularly expressive because it allows us to directly express our judgments of the human condition. So uh, we definitely want to, uh, this is a beautiful example of the human condition being expressed in mathematical terms. Um, let's see. So, but you probably need to adjust it. That is, when you say it's a curving up, 
how steeply does it curve up? Does it, you know, curve like that or does it go like that? Well, there, there are two standard ways or actually three standard ways to adjust these graphs. A linear graph is adjust with a multiplicative uh, coefficient. In other words, if y equals a, 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 equal, instead of having y equals x, you say y equals a constant times x. And if the constant is high, then it goes zip way up fast. And if the constant is low, then the straight line is pretty flat. And so if you want a stronger response, you use a higher value of the constant. Simple. For um, uh, the curving graphs, though, for the upward curve, you use uh, exponentiation. Uh, you square it. In, or cube it or something, you, you stick an exponent on, on it, y equals x to the a value. Now, I'll warn you, if you use squaring and cubing, it's going to take off really fast. So in most cases where you want um, uh, exponentiation, start off with you know 1.5, 1.3 as the exponent, that's it won't shoot completely out of range too quickly. But it depends on your circumstances. So uh, uh, and by the way, one problem with uh, numbers less than one is that if you uh, use a positive exponent, they get smaller. So you actually have to use a negative exponent when you're less than one and a positive when you're greater than one if you want it to shoot up. Um, let's see, the, uh, um, uh, for the curve down, it's the other way around. If you want it to curve down, you, uh, then you would use a negative exponent on the, uh, wait a minute. Well, you can also use fractional exponents. It's, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. But uh, uh, for curve down, you use the opposite system that you use for cur curve up. So, um, you know, I have never thought about why you would use a negative exponent as opposed to a fractional exponent. Okay, I think I see the, well, you uh, <laughs> experiment with it. Yeah, the difference between them, the negative exponent uh, is, is basically just a division. Yeah, that's, yeah, I'm not gonna try to explain it now because I don't understand it well enough to explain it really clearly. But yes, there's definitely a difference. Uh, you're probably better off just using fractional exponents. Um, yeah, avoid the negative exponents for now. Uh, so for adjustment purpose, and you're going to do a lot of adjustments in, in your work. You're going to spend a lot of your time adjusting these things. Oh, geez, boy. Uh, uh, Princess Leia bit off the head of Han Solo. I, I think the exponent for temper is too high. Scale it down a little. You do a lot of this and, and you just do it by trial and error and screwing around with the numbers. After a while, you develop a feeling though for how these, uh, how these exponents affect the behavior of the graph and it becomes easier. Uh, okay, now let's talk about combining numbers. That is, we were just talking about a one-dimensional thing, y equals uh, uh, x to the uh, exponent. Uh, what happens when you're combining two? Well, there's some simple rules for that as well. Uh, let's take the case of uh, uh, the standard example I use is, let's imagine uh, Tommy Teenager is working on his car in the garage. Now, this is this may sound really strange these days because 
teenagers don't work on cars anymore. But when I was a kid, they did. They would they would get these old, old cars. They'd buy them for a hundred bucks and then they'd fix them up. And uh, uh, they were always working on the cars and, you know, making them more powerful and stuff like that. Uh, so imagine this is 1956 and Tommy is working on his car and something goes wrong and the car comes off the jacks. He's crawled underneath it and there's just enough space, but something goes wrong and now it goes bump and it's crushing him and he's gone. Ah, ah. Okay, mom hears his uh, uh, cries and runs out and sees the situation and she has to lift the car. Come on, she's mom. How is mom going to lift a car? Well, it depends on two things. How strong she is and how motivated she is. There really are cases where people have uh, um, performed astounding feats of strength in truly desperate situations. And so it is possible with in immense motivation to, uh, to get a better, uh, to show greater strength. So we wanna express this idea that her motivation and her physical strength somehow combine to determine whether she can lift this. Now, the way we'll do this, though, is by calculating the amount of weight that she can lift. So she'll have her physical strength, which we'll measure by weight. So just her normal weight lifting capacity is 200 pounds. But then how does her motivation affect that? It could increase it. Or if for the uh, matter she really hates her son, then it'll decrease her effective strength. So how do we combine motivation with strength? The simple rule for that is to reduce it to Boolean terms. That is, say, do these two terms compensate for each other? That is, if she's got a lot of one and a little of the other, and that's exactly the same as if she has a lot of the other and a little of one, then, uh, in other words, if she has tons of strength but doesn't give a shit, she'll be able to, uh, to lift it up. Or if she's intensely motivated, but she's uh, uh, a paraplegic, she can still lift it up. Uh, so if, if they do this, then you add them. However, if both of them are required to achieve the highest value, then you multiply them. So notice if it boils down to either or, or both and. So when you reduce it to Boolean terms like that, you can see uh, in this case, you add them together. And in this case, you multiply them together. That's the logic. And it's, it's, it's fairly straightforward and it works. So uh, I'm going to challenge you again. Use your assessment, your judgment of human nature and tell me, do we multiply or do we add together her strength and her motivation? Okay, so we got mostly multiply, uh, multiply, but we have one add. Um, Chris makes a very important point that it does depend on your dramatic goals. Uh, nevertheless, I, I think it, what we're really judging here is human nature. And my personal assessment is that you multiply them, but I will not say that Johannes is wrong. 
it's human nature. This is art, you know. Is the Mona Lisa a good painting? Is Beethoven's Ninth Symphony a great symphony? Well, that's a matter of taste. And so I'm sure that Johannes could make it work uh, using addition. It's just, it's a different way of viewing human nature. That's all there is to it. Uh, let's see. Okay, so however, now you have a new and even more interesting problem. When you're combining these two elements, let's say we're gonna multiply them. Um, how do you assign relative weight? I mean, let's say you're measuring her physical strength on a scale of, of kilograms. You know, she can lift a hundred kilograms uh, and you're, um, measuring her motivation on a scale of zero to one, let's say. So zero means she doesn't care at all. When, when you multiply by her physical strength produces a zero. So she doesn't care, then clearly has no effect. But in the case where she, let's say she's motivated 100%, that is with a one, well, that means she can only reach her maximum strength of 100 kilograms of lifting power. But we tend to believe that people who are passionately motivated can do more. How much more? We need to multiply that value of one by something. Or we need to increase it. I don't want to say multiply. So... Again, how do we increase it? Now, here's the problem. If you're multiplying them, let's say you say, well, if you're highly motivated, then you can, that allows you to double your strength. Um, so you're going to say, we'll multiply by two. That won't work. Because you see, um, that multiplier could apply, well, darn it, I chose a bad example. Um, because that uh, the way her strength works, uh, that the, your problem is if your formula is um, strength multiplied by motivation multiplied by two, that two can apply can be doubling the motivation or doubling the strength. It goes through the entire expression, uh, and so you're really not increasing, you're not selecting one of the terms, the motivation, and, and goosing that up. You're goosing both of them at the same time. If you want to do this properly, you want to in, increase the value of motivation relative to the value of strength, and that's where you have to use exponentiation. So you take her motivation and you know, square it or raise it to 1.5 power. That applies only to motivation. So that's how you differentiate between two multiplied terms, exponentiate one. Or for that matter, you could uh, use a fractional exponent on this. You take the square root of 100 pounds, 100 kilograms, and you get 10 kilograms or whatever. Um, so in combining elements, if you need to adjust their relative strengths in the overall formula, you take the one that you want to make str uh, uh, stronger and you exponentiate it uh, upward. Or you take the one you want to make weaker and exponentiate it downward, whichever you prefer. Um, but that's, that's how you handle uh, things when you uh, 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 multiply them together. When you add them, you can use a multiplicative constant. So you can say, if you, in Johanna's case, he would say um, strength plus constant, time, plus two times motivation. That would work perfectly well for him. Different arrangement, but it works. Those are the basics. And with just 
the information I have given you so far, you can accomplish an enormous amount. Uh, I mean, this covers a huge range. You don't need to go much further. I have found uh, that this kind of thing is uh, uh, adequate for almost everything I've done. Now, of course, when you're using bounded numbers, it's a little different, but uh, uh, for that, you want to use the blend operator. But for uh, regular numbers, uh, this is the way to do it. And in fact, to give you an idea of, of how powerful this is, I did a large simulation called Balance of the Planet about ecological, environmental, and economic problems. And uh, with, um, with that, I think there's approximately 100 uh, terms in the simulation. That is, there are 100 factors to consider, like how much coal the world is burning, uh, how much food it's making, what the GDP of the entire planet is, stuff like that. And uh, all of these were interlinked in this com complicated network of cause and effect. And I did everything with linear equations, uh, just you know, uh, in a few places I used some exponentials, but for the most part, it was all done with linear equations and a huge network of them. And it really didn't take that long to balance the entire system. That is, the user has various inputs and he can fiddle around with them. And I managed to rig it so that no matter what inputs you give, it doesn't blow up on you. That is, there's no... If you do this, then everybody dies the next day. But if you do that, then the world lives happily ever after for the next 10,000 years. Um, uh, do I think in uh, terms of a subjective simulation when I'm creating a story world? Um, wait, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I had the thing tuned up too loud. Uh, please repeat your question. Yeah, I just wanted to know, do you think of in terms of a subjective simulation when you're creating a story world? Like you're describing? Yeah, yeah. What, what I was doing with Balance of the Planet was clearly a simulation, but it was subjective. This was my assessment of the world of economics, uh, ecology, uh, all of the factors that mix together to affect the way we deal with the environment. My personal assessment. However, in the first version of Balance of the Planet, which I built in 1990, I had a wonderful feature I'm so proud of. Uh, every, it was all linear equations back then. And I had a feature that allowed you to actually adjust the linear coefficients. And I explained how it worked. For example, there were nuclear power plants how much nuclear power are you using, uh, is the world using? And wait a minute, nuclear power plants can have accidents and kill people. So there's a coefficient for that. The number of people who are killed by nuclear power plants is equal to a constant times the amount of nuclear power you're generating. Very simple, right? I put in a number. I said, you know, for every gigawatt hour of, uh, of nuclear electricity you produce, you're gonna kill 0.1 people. Okay, great, wonderful. But maybe someone else will think they're more dangerous than that. They, maybe they'll think 0.2 or 0.5. Maybe they'll think they're safer than that. I had a system where when you came to the nuclear power part, there was a little button you could click on. You push that button and it kind of flips around and it shows you the equation and the coefficient and there's a slider there and you can slide the value up to bigger or smaller and come up with your own version. I, I was subjective in putting the limits of the slider, but I was really liberal in, in okay, it's really, really dangerous or it's really, really safe. You can choose anything in between that. Um, so that allowed people to put in their own prejudices. Uh, nobody ever used it. Why? 
math. Uh, that was a hard lesson for me. So uh, I did not put that feature into the second edition of Balance of the Planet. So uh, maybe I will if people demand it, but I very much doubt they will. So Can I ask you what, what kind of research you did for Balance of the Planet? Oh, Can I've been... I've been researching these issues since 1977 when I had a job teaching about it. And I've very much kept up on it. And uh, uh, in fact, in the new balance of the planet, I explain all sorts of factors at work. Um, and, you know, what we know about nuclear power plant safety, what we know about rad waste disposal, uh, uh, different types of coal. Uh, and along the way, I throw in some fun things like the, uh, darn it, what is it called? The Germans have very shallow, uh, very large, but very shallow coal seams, <coughs> very thick as well. And they have built the biggest uh, vehicle on the planet. It's this huge, they actually built several of them, these huge machines that have a digging shovel that is gigantic and it digs out the coal and puts it onto the conveyor belt. It's, it is stupendous. And uh, it, it needs basically its own power plant to make electricity to run this thing. It's and so I had a whole little section on that. Um, but yes, there's an enormous amount of research has gone into it over decades. Um, in fact, all of my games, I have researched very carefully. Uh, typically, I acquire uh, a lot of books for balance of power. There were about 20 books I bought uh, in preparing for that. Uh, let's see. So, yeah, a lot of research goes into these things. Um, but the thing is, the research doesn't give me any of the math. The research just gives me lots of facts. And I then draw my, uh, draw my own conclusions about what the numbers should be and what the formula should be. So none of the, uh, none of the research will ever produce, uh, formulas or numbers. You just got to make them up. And that's, that's the way it goes. Um, oh, Ajmal has a good question here. Bounded numbers versus sigmoid or tanch functions. Oh, geez. Uh, first, I do not recommend the tanch functions. Uh, they are... Uh, I have used them occasionally and they do have a proclivity to go psychotic. Uh, that is, it's really tricky when you're using them to ensure that the numbers don't suddenly take off to infinity and so forth. So uh, uh, now that's largely because Tanch functions are, uh, are more difficult to understand. I'm sure that if I spent a lot of time working with these functions, I could develop a feel for them and, and, and get them working. So if you want to do that, by all means. Um, let's see. Um, other sigmoid functions. Oh, the problem is there's so many. Uh, and again, some of them are, are psychotic. Um, it, it all depends on the function. Basically, the bounded numbers is a sigmoid function. Um, so I would suggest, I mean, there might be a better one out there. I have not taken the time to survey all of these and find the perfect one. In fact, I am rather uncomfortable. One aspect of the bounded numbers is that they only work really well in the range of about minus 0. 0.5 to plus 0. 0.5. Once you start getting out beyond those, they don't go psychotic, they go sluggard. They, they show, it's very hard to shift these numbers around once they get, uh, once a bounded number gets out to about 0. 0.9, 
it's really hard to bring it back down into a normal range. So uh, uh, that that's possible. Right, that, that's a flaw with bounded numbers. Uh, again, I think it would be very interesting for somebody to take the time and go through all the different variations of sigmoid functions and, uh, and figure out which is the best. So <laughs> good luck. That's a huge research project though. Um, let's see. So I think I've covered everything I wanted to cover. Uh, let's just have some general discussion now. I can, what, what is the best way to apply this method? Do you do it in front of the computer or do you just do it on paper? Or? Um, for tuning, far and away, the best uh, way to tune a system of equations is to play with them on the computer. Um, and uh, a, that can be very difficult with a system. I don't know. I've done this so many times. I, I have to say, you do have to develop a feel for how a system works and how to push it, how to find those, those places where it's going to blow up in your face. Um, I had a nice system with, the, uh, uh, with Storytron uh, called Rehearsal, where you could actually run the whole system from the beginning and you just keep going and going and going. And at any point, you could stop it and, and see the, the contributions of the different factors to each decision. Um, in the end, that proved out to be only marginally useful. Uh, I found later on that the, uh, that beautiful debugging feature Oh, what did, do you remember what we called it, Chris, where you could actually go in and see each step of the calculations, you could break it down? It's like script or something? Pardon? The scriptalyzer? Uh, uh, scriptalyzer, no, that was the graphical display, uh, which also did a, a lot of, uh, was very helpful for that process. Um, Whatever <laughs> the, the uh, Storytron, its true value may ultimately be not in itself, but in some of the ideas built into it as a tool. The scriptalizer was a brilliant tool for evaluating individual scripts, which were formula mathematical formulas. That was really good because you could really you could play with the numbers and wiggle them around and see the results in real time. That was a good tool. And then the one that allowed you to actually go into the calculation step by step. It showed the whole thing in a it, beautifully. You could see the entire story as it developed in, you know, uh, a fairly small uh, screen but you could zero in on any event that took place and expand it and look at that entire event and then go into the parts of the event and say, no, no, wait a minute. Why did he choose to give the bicycle instead of the book? And you can go in and bicycle and you can expand that and see, here's why he chose the bicycle. Uh, pardon? Log lizard was the name of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very good, log wizard. So uh, anyway, that was, uh, damn, that was a good tool. So I very much hope that if anybody builds uh, another system, they use either something like log lizard and or something like uh, scriptalizer. Although log lizard is, lizard is keyed to the notion of a system that proceeds event by event. Uh, some systems don't permit that. So in other issues, questions, comments? Yeah, do, do story vaults need to be hundreds of encounters? Do they need to be large? I, I'm sorry, I always have problems 
I, I understanding when people talk. Yeah, okay, I'm just saying even harder. How do I break my story world? Do I use three acts to create a story world? Oh, I just... no, you don't need a three act structure. Uh, in fact, I would, I would say for now, let's if we can get one act working, that's that's great. So, uh, uh, yeah, the the. Narratology, what we know about how to build a good story is so far over our heads right now in terms of what can be built on a computer that I don't think it's terribly important to pay a lot of attention to it. We can get some, some bits of inspiration from it. For example, one of the things, uh, the, uh, Perhaps the single most important lesson we can draw from narratology is that we don't care about spatial location. This is a classic mistake that games people do. They start off and they say, let's design a game. We'll have a map and X, Y coordinates. And they move people around on X, Y coordinates. Stories never do that. They never have positions. At best, they have stages and actors disappear from one stage and reappear on another stage. And it's just pop, pop, pop. Um, that's something we can learn. Uh, in fact, it's good to use the terminology of, of uh, stories. We don't have objects, we have props. Uh, we have actors, uh, you know, so, and time in storytelling is not continuous. Uh, this is something that games people always trip up over. Uh, for example, in stories, we don't fill in the details of people going to the bathroom or uh, eating dinner, unless it's dramatically significant. And we don't even bother telling you that they sleep at night. They know that. And the audience already knows that. So you can have something occur on Tuesday and then the next thing that, next thing you know, it's Friday. <laughs> That's fine in stories, but games people have a problem with that. And so get past that problem. Think in terms of stories. Um, any last questions? Yeah, what about like when the, when the actors are taking decisions? Is that what the story world is basically about? They're like taking lots of decisions where like yeah. the actors are talking yeah. to each other. And you want the decisions to be dramatically significant decisions. You don't want them making decisions about, well, do I have the, the vorpal blade or the triangle blade? Uh, that's not dramatically significant. It's significant if you're gonna be just fighting dragons or something, but um, <clears throat> for drama, the decisions people make involve other people. So what are you gonna to do to this person? What are you gonna to do to that person? Another big, big lesson from stories that took me a long time to really comprehend is that uh, the action, no single action in a story is decisive. That is, you'll have, you may have that decisive decision at the very end of the story, but most of the story is a series of small steps, tiny little things that slowly build up. And thus, Luke Skywalker in that movie starts off meeting uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi and doing all these things. And he goes through all sorts of things which are affecting him. And at the very end of the movie, he makes his one crucial decision, which is, do I trust the force or do I trust my targeting computer? That's his decision. He makes the decision to trust the force and he blows up the Death Star that way. Um, that's the only big decision, but that could not have happened without all the zillions of little decisions he made before that. He had to be convinced that Obi-Wan was right, that Obi-Wan was onto the right answer, that this is the way to go. So in a good story world, 
you build up lots and lots and lots of little bitty decisions that ultimately lead to a final conclusion. Um, let's see, you mentioned before that there was a fundamental problem with C-boot, which is the fact that players intellectualize relationships instead of feeling them. I think that the issue is also present in the new version of gossip, yes, uh, uh, although the presentation is better, yes. Do you think that the player characters starting off without knowing anything about the relationships between the characters instead of starting from being a pre-existing web of, would fix that and allow us to get rid of the need to present them all together? Uh, very good question, because the player would learn about the other characters and their relationships in sync with his character. Yes, yes, definitely. In fact, that is what I am learning to do with uh, Le Morte d'Artur. Le Morte d'Artur represents a major shift in the way I'm approaching these problems. Um, it's using the encounter system, but it starts off, uh, the main thing is it's initially mostly expository. That is the encounters you, you start off with are trivial. And in many cases, you don't even make a decision. It just does this and you can say, oh, okay, that's nice. And you move on to the next one. So initially it's all expository, but then you start being able to make decisions and the decisions you make are fairly small. Um, <coughs> I think the first dramatically significant decision you make uh, comes when you you're Arthur and you return uh, after having gone fishing Guinevere had asked you to collect some bay leaves that are used as a spice uh, on your way back and you forgot and you come back and she asked you for the bay leaves and she's obviously disappointed that you did not and do you respond by saying oh I'm really sorry about that that was really stupid of me or do you respond all right damn it I'll go get the bay leaves right now that's your decision um so uh, actually that's I presented it in more extreme terms than it really exists um but you're making very minor decisions for a good portion of it, but the decisions start getting to be more and more important. And uh, because by that time, you're starting to get to know the characters and so forth. So it's a ramping up process. And I think that's the, uh, we'll, we'll see. I, I am confident that this is a lot better than my earlier system. But I cannot say if it is good enough. We'll just have to let people decide. Uh, uh, is it really long to let it be a continuous story? Um, a continuous story still has jumps in it. Uh, you know, uh, Clearly, the events at, at no point do you ever see Luke Skywalker going to bed, but we can be assured that all those events that take place in that first movie did not take place in just one day. So there were just jumps. Uh, time jumps the way that people or people jump through time the same way they jump through space in stories. So uh, it's narratively continuous but temporally discontinuous. <clears throat> Can we, yeah, we just don't need to include the extraneous. In fact, a good story excludes the extraneous uh, components. Uh, you deliberately get rid of those. Uh, that was something that uh, a rather uh, a nasty comment I once made about uh, The Sims uh, was that good stories uh, take the take life and remove all of the boring components to show only the dramatic components. The Sims takes life and removes all the dramatic components to leave only the boring components. Um, <clears throat> which was my criticism of The Sims. Let's see, but what if the player goes back to the story world after a long time of not playing? 
Wouldn't there be a problem with memory? I thought about adding a journal where the player can record his experiences. Oh, uh, that's in my mind, a secondary problem. Uh, yeah, it would be nice, but you know, if you go back and watch a, a movie a second time, it's what's enjoyable is that you're, in fact, <clears throat> I may have mentioned this earlier, Kathy and I are now going through the entire uh, series, Star Trek Deep Space Nine on Netflix. And uh, we last saw it 25 years ago. And so this is all new to us again. Uh, this is one of the wonderful things about getting old and losing your memory. It's you get to relive old things and it's all new to you again. Um, but uh, uh, that isn't a problem. The fact that we've forgotten it isn't bad. It's good. We can, we can enjoy this stuff again. Um, by the way, I once again want to emphasize, uh, I think it is very useful to contrast Deep Space Nine with any of the other Star Trek series. Uh, basically, the other Star Deep Space Nine is about drama. And I'm condensing extremely. Deep Space Nine is about drama. The other Star Treks are about adventure. See if you can see that difference. Uh, and then if the player, oh, pauses mid story world, not after finishing it, ooh. Um, well, it depends on, on the time delay between uh, stopping and resuming. Presumably, I mean, when you watch a TV series, you, you watch it and then you have to wait for another week before you see the next episode. So people seem to be able to remember. Uh, might be better to just let the player, player page through old encounters in a story world, including the choice. Eh, maybe, maybe. Uh, I don't know. I, I see this as a, well, probably a secondary problem. Most people are, you know, they'll play for an hour or two and then they'll come back the next night and they should be able to remember. So uh, we have much bigger problems than this. So, well, we're way over time, so I'm going to put an end to this. Uh, thank you for your commentary and especially for your questions. And uh, I'll see you next month. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.